Today on Rambling About Cars, it's Mustang Day. Actually, April 17th is Mustang Day. It's oh, almost yeah. here. And we have legit Mustang royalty with us today to talk about all things Mustang. If you think you know everything about Mustang, you will learn something this time around, and you're going to be supremely entertained by it. So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, Mustang maniacs of the world, it's podcast time. Across the way is co-host Chris Bruce. I'm Christopher Smith. What's up, Bruce? Not much. I'm happy to be here. We have John Clore. He is the enthusiast communications manager for Ford Performance. And basically that means he is the supreme overlord of all Ford Mustang knowledge. He's written two books on Mustangs. He uh, started out in the journalism world, spent some time there, and then started getting into the car thing. And uh, spent time at Auto Week, spent time at Edmonds. Uh, he works back in the day at SVT Communications, and he know, he is the Lord Almighty of Mustang knowledge, and we are very happy to have him here today. So welcome, John. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Somebody called me the Joel Osteen of the Church of Mustang. I don't do that. I don't, <laughs> don't, I don't, don't have, do that. I don't have a stadium. That's all I'm going to do. Well, and, and let me and let me just state for the record, too, that I used to work with John uh, a little bit back in the day. We've been friends for a while. So full disclosure, we're probably going to go off the rails a little bit. That's going to be a really good thing because yeah, be, because, hey, there's so much to talk about. Um, and they also on a personal note, John was kind of the guy that got me to where I am here right now. He was the one that kind of stepped up and said, hey. Smitty and nobody else calls me Smitty, but you, John. So that, that, you know, special perk there. He's like, well, this guy actually kind of knows how to write it. He knows the stuff. So you're the reason I'm where I'm at right now, which is a very tiny little room in a very <laughs> tiny little house in the middle of nowhere. So thank you for putting me on that trajectory, John. I always love making sure nobody makes any money in the business. <laughs> if, now, you spent, if you would have spent the whole time talking about, my background and your background, we'd be out of the hour, and there goes our whole time. So, exactly. thank you for that, though. Uh, yeah, don't put two cool. narcissists together. This is nothing this about is a bad you, idea. Smitty. You, 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 no offense, but many people in your generation, I just found either knew a lot about cars and couldn't write, or could write but knew nothing about cars. And you, you had a weird mix, so that's why I hung around with you for a while, except for your trench coat and that hat. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the right back, the me. hats are still there. The trench oh, coat's still. Right. The, the trench coat still in the closet. What's the, what's the big deal with the trench coat? It's a oh, nice no. black leather trench coat. It blows majestically in the wind. Oh, don't, please don't go there tonight. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's well, talk Mustang. Well, before we do that, though, before we do that, since John is a new guest on the program, we do have to go through our obligatory rambling about cars quiz. John, there are no wrong answers here, but the world will judge you internally on your answers. <laughs> So we're just going to run through this quiz just really quick, right off the top of your head. Favorite car of the 70s? I probably know this. You'd be surprised. It's a 1970 Mach 1. Oh, okay. Cool. A little surprise there. Favorite car of the 80s? Uh, I would say an SVO Mustang. Oh, SVO Mustang. Oh, okay. Yeah. Coupe, convertible, or T-top? Sorry, T-top for me. Really? Why? I'm, I'm down with that. It gives you all the uh, open air feeling of a convertible with a much more secure feeling, and you don't worry about people with knives. <laughs> it's true. And also, if you forget to shower that day and you happen to be caught in a rainstorm, problem yeah, solved. And, and birds have to be a better aim. <laughs> um, if you could drive a level five fully autonomous car right now, would you? Which means no steering wheel, by the way. No, just no, no steering wheel. wheel. Just you get in it and tell it where to go. I uh, did that with my Aurora model motoring set, so no. <laughs> <laughs> okay last, last question oh last you're... last question do you want to read it bruce or do you want me to read it go for it okay last question because i know you've got a lot of experience with this what's scarier sitting in the passenger seat of a mustang during mustang week at, at myrtle beach or being a bystander on the roads during mustang week at myrtle beach well, I would say being a bystander because some of the people that I sit with, guys like Gary Patterson at Shelby, actually know how to drive. So, uh, and you know, Jim Owens and all the folks at Ford, there are a lot of good drivers. So, I would say being a bystander because that way I would know. I look down the last time I see my knees. Watch that, <laughs> watch that, watch that Terminator completely wipe me out. You know. <laughs> very good, very good. You have passed the quiz, as far as we know. 
let's so i mean let's talk some more about mustangs um well first of all i'm sure there are going to be some people out there that are like there's a national holiday for mustangs well no there's not a national holiday but what is mustang day well technically there is a national holiday and and you'd think this would have been something that's been going on forever you know people always you know recognize certain dates in history but it wasn't until we did the 50th anniversary event uh, and, you know, in the 2014 50th anniversary of the Mustang Club of America, where one of the organizers of that, of that event who uh, helped, helped throw the event in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, at the Motor Speedway, went off and with a couple of investors started a Mustang uh, museum. And uh, the Mustang Owners Museum is, uh, it's started down there with the Dennis Carpenter folks. It's no longer at that building. But this guy said, how am I going to fund this? I mean, you know, Mustang... Museums don't uh, they rely on admissions. So he came up with the idea of doing a National Mustang Day where he would sell a, a, a decal for your windshield and sell it to all the clubs. You send in a list of all the clubs that are what they're going to do. And he created a website, National Mustang Day, and it's, it's out there right now. And this thing went on for like five years, National Mustang Day. He'd sell the stickers. He used it as a fundraiser for the Mustang Owners Museum. And then a year or so ago, yes. As always, it does happen, Chris. Um, corporate America thought, what a great idea. And <laughs> used his name because he already used National Mustang Day. So now it's called Global Mustang Week. And Ford uh, actually has Global Mustang Week and Global Mustang Day. And uh, that's how it really got started. It wasn't until 2016 when the first NMD came along. And I'm surprised it hadn't been done earlier. But mm -hmm. that's how it came to be. And it's celebrated all over the world. Clubs yeah. in Europe, clubs in China, uh, in Australia. I mean, you, go, you can go look on that website and see two, three hundred clubs who've listed their events. It's everywhere where people go out and drive their Mustang on April seventeenth. That's just the way it works. Well, and fortunately, for I just younger got... listeners, though, can you explain why it's on April seventeenth? Sure. So back there, the, that photo you have the in, in April seventeenth, nineteen sixty four, at the New York World's Fair in Flushing Meadows, New York. Ford had the audacity to launch a car in spring when everybody comes out with cars in, in the fall. And they launched this new fang, newfangled idea of a personal sporty car called the Mustang. And it took the world by storm. Nobody expected anything like this with, you know, with, with its look, its style, its price, its, its affordability, its the option packages. It was just an amazing product that came out in the middle of uh, a surprise time at the New York World's Fair. It was on the cover. Of, Lee Iacocca became super famous because of this. It was on mm -hmm. all three networks at the same time. It was on the mm -hmm. cover of uh, Time and Newsweek at the same time. And uh, the, the, the story goes, you would be hard-pressed to try to buy one in its first 18 months. They sold 417,000 of these things and almost a million of them in the first year and a half which is unheard of. That record will probably never be broken for a single mark. It's just that everybody fell in love with it. And because it was affordable, you know, for 2368 FOB Detroit, you could drive away in that car. Unfortunately, nobody really ordered a base Mustang. <laughs> and the cool thing about this car is I dare you to go to a Mustang show today or, and find two of them that are exactly the same. No, you're, they're, you're not wrong there. You're not wrong. They're as individual as every American this car is as pure America as there is any automobile, probably the most iconic uh, American automobile on the planet, bar none. And if you do see a nun in a bar, let me know. But uh, <laughs> well, I had to use that. But uh, no, well, let me this car is, is totally, completely all American unique, and it's still being used in advertising today. So just real quick, though. So the story I've heard is that the first one actually sold to an individual was sold to a teacher because basically she showed up at the dealer and they, she was asking for a car and they sold it to her early, something like that. Am, am I getting that story at least half right? Yeah, you got it completely right. The Chicago area teacher was looking for a convertible and happened to come into a Ford dealership three days before this car was supposed to go on sale. And they, of course, Ford had delivered some of these and made dealers promise to put them in the back room mm -hmm. and don't bring them out till April 17th. They only got one. And when she went in and looked at a Fairlane convertible, she didn't want it. She looked at a Galaxy, didn't want it too big. And before she walked out, because this uh, salesman knew she had money in her hand, uh, he said, look, let me show you something I have in the back room. He walked back there. She saw a Mustang convertible, powder baby blue, fell in love with it. 
bought it that then and there and actually took delivery of that car. She, that car was sold to her before Mustang was officially on sale. <laughs> and to this date, I know that people know about her because she was celebrated at the 50th. She still has yep. the car with her husband, Bill. They uh, they restored it. She goes to shows. And the rumor was she was thinking, well, maybe I should put it up for bids at a Barrett Jackson auction. So if you guys want to buy it, maybe in a year or two, she'll be ready to let it go. And you'd have not only the first retail sale Mustang, but one that was sold before the car went on sale. It, isn't that something, especially now when you see automakers debuting their cars and like it'll be on a sale year, two, two years, years from years now. Time. And and here's one that was sold before it was even announced. No, I I, uh, I remember back at Mustang 50th um, the, when when the 2015 came out, uh, getting to meet her. It, it's a neat story. Uh, she was a little unsure if she'd give up her husband first or her Mustang. Um, <laughs> which... know, people confuse this with the dogs. So not the first Mustang number one. No, it's not Mustang number it's one. It's not number that one. Car, yeah, that car was sold to a Canadian airline pilot. And he drove it for years until Ford says, maybe we should have saved it, tracked it down, and had to buy it back. And had to give him the one millionth Mustang in exchange for the car. And now it's in the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn. Mustang number two was arguably owned by uh, an author that I happen to know who wrote Mustang Genesis, Bob Freya, who just passed away this past year because of COVID. But he had number two. It was just a six-cylinder coupe. Um, but I mean, we're talking about VIN sequence, you know, the ones that were number right. one, number two. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, the retail sell car. And there's a, I'm telling you guys, I've been in this hobby now for 25 years at Ford, and there is nothing. Everybody, you don't have to work at Ford. You could, you can even hate Mustangs. You, everybody has a Mustang story. You, you don't have to own one. <laughs> you're not, you're not wrong. Everybody does. Everybody have a Mustang. has a, yeah. the guy in high school had one. Your boyfriend, your uncle, the kid down the street. You I got hit by one. Mustang. They all have them. Everyone in the world has a Mustang story, and it's really the only car. I mean, maybe other than the Volkswagen Beetle, but the problem with that is that it's just not as cool as a Mustang. So if you have that, it's yeah. Cool, We're talking funky Con context, John. Context. Come cute. on, you're a context guy. Cute. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't like to call any car cute. If you call it cute, then it's really not really a car. Come on. God, I'm, I'm really starting to see where some of my automotive tastes have come from. Now. Oh, Bruce yeah, and I have like, had, yeah, I know, and I like, had similar conversations. I don't want my car to look cute. You like Kia Souls and the hamsters. Yeah, that's what I had. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I still think about a soul. I still think about it from time to time with the hamster oh, suit. He's God, no. I, I would I would rock that at a car show, pull oh, yeah. up with a hamster suit. You know, I how much prefer, you know how much attention I'd get? I prefer cars with real heritage instead of hiring some guy in a hamster suit. Uh, you know, when you have real heritage, like people with Mustang or people like, I don't know, you ever hear some guy named I don't know, Carol Shelby, maybe Steve McQueen, or your, my favorite, Farrah Fawcett Majors. I mean, these are real people. You're, I, mean, I mean, you're not wrong there, but but actually, let's let's kind of spin that direction. Let's let's spin that direction a little bit. Well, yeah, um, to try because, hey, we know that you are Mustang through and through. So. Try to try to give me an, as an, an objective answer as possible here. Why do you think Mustang has had its staying power versus Camaro that has come and gone over the years? And now it looks like it's most it's likely going to go again. It's going to go again. And when you look at the sales, I mean, for the most part, Mustang has always been ahead of Camaro in sales. I'm going to say it right here. Camaro is a cool car. Camaro is a very <laughs> cool car. I, I love them all. I'm I'm not too keen about the you know the '98 you know kind of that, that that tail end they got kind of bulbous and rounded but um, I mean the current Camaros are exceptional. Why didn't the Camaro get the just get the same kind of status and and achieve the same kind of success that Mustang did? It's it's real simple, and uh, once you study how Ford had marketed and made the Mustang, you'll see why it stayed connected with its ownership base, and that's because. When you come out of the gate with a million cars, you obviously hit a button somewhere. It, it did something. So what Ford did is it immediately connected with its buyers and not just the buyers, which is what research is about. Because the most researched car in Ford history is the Edsel. The mm -hmm. least researched car in Ford's history is the Mustang. And the reason why they stuck with the idea of sticking with enthusiasts, because they wanted to know what were the what were the buttons, what did we push that made you so crazy about this car? So what they did is they immediately started the the International Council of Mustang Clubs and the National Council of Mustang Clubs, and they would they actually took over the Ford managed clubs to have rallies with your first gen Mustang 
all over the country. Big cities all over the country had Mustang rallies, and kids could get together in their Mustang and go to a picnic and a barbecue, and they had meetings, and it was like a social, it was like the Facebook only in reality and real people and not fake accounts. It was like the real deal of a social interaction with an automobile. So this car makes, one makes a personal mental connection with its owner, visceral. So it's got, you've got, you get some kind of relationship with the car and then Ford connects immediately with the enthusiast to find out, well, what is it about Mustang that we have to do to keep pushing your buttons? And throughout its history, it's always been able to stay connected with whatever changes ha happened in society that they had to make sure, okay, well, th we're going this way, we're going that way. What do they want? They want a big block. We got to make it bigger. They want a muscle car. We got to make it a muscle car with a 428. They want fuel economy. Okay, we'll make a smaller one. You know, they want something cool and different. All right, there comes the Fox body. We want the red, you know, every time America wanted something, the reason why Ford knew, because it was always connected with the enthusiast base. Chevrolet had clubs and Camaros, but they, they went their way and they had people within the company who know everything, um, just like every company has. And, you know, I, I, look, I, I stood at um, SVT tents at Ford and had some Camaro guy walk by. Hey, we didn't have to put a blower on it to make it cool, make it go fast. And I'd say, yeah, but we didn't have to go away and find ourselves to figure out, <laughs> what, figure out what we wanted to be when we grew up. We just put a blower on it, you know. So those that to me, the connection it's always had with the enthusiasts had given Ford an advantage that they knew the next step that what it had to be and f to their own credit had come out each time and hit the, the, the thing right out of the park, except for maybe when we almost made it the front wheel drive Mazda probe. Um, that that almost happened. That almost happened. We'll we'll get to that in a yeah, in a. So I mean, look, look, face it. Look at all the changes it's gone through, and in each one of those iterations, go look at Mustang sales. Every time they came up with a new one, it went up. Well, let me let me kind of spin a little bit off of that to, to talk a little bit more about some specific cars because um, to let everybody know, John, you own three Mustangs right now, correct? Including yeah. including one that's a long term project. Now, what uh, one of those is a Mustang too, right? Well, two of them are. Okay, uh -huh. so you own you own two Mustang twos, um, and and over the years that car has just kind of become the poster child of what not to do. And we were talking before the podcast on why and and listen to this, everybody, why all of you people right now that love your Shelbys, that love your Coyotes, that love everything that came after 1979, you owe the Mustang to your allegiance because that car is one of the main reasons why we have the cars that we have today. So, John, you have, and I find this very interesting, you have Mustang 2s, kind of the 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 redheaded stepchild oh, yeah. of the Mustang group, um, and I have a 95 Mustang, an SN95, and when I go to Mustang events and Ford events, the two, the two models that I see the least of are Mustang 2 and SN95. So let's let's talk a little bit about those cars and maybe explore why that is and then also explore why they should be more why they should be getting more love we'll say than they deserve <laughs> well it's it's no that's that's not a secret i mean uh, the, the original mustang is the original the only can be an original once and you know once the world fell in love with it, it is what it is uh it's it's really first reskin on the same platform by the way a lot of people think oh the 67 and 68 was the second generation no no that was actually the same platform and uh that reskin was really america's favorite the 67 the 68 the bullet mirrors and then by the time we got to 69 and 70 with the mach ones you know mustang was in the muscle car wars but guess what happened by the time we got into the bunky nuts era when he came over to ford to become president and he wanted cars with long noses and protruding beaks they called the bunky beaks the 71 to 73s started nose diving in sales and as the last time i checked the uh, car companies want to sell cars to be popular, they weren't popular. Yeah. So when the sales got down to nothing, there was a woman who stood up at the uh, the board meeting and, and told Henry II, "What did you do to my Mustang? It's uh, you know it's gigantic, it's expensive, and it's a gas hog, and I want it to be what it was when it first came out, it's small and thrifty and fun and beautiful." And so he put Iacocca, who's you know everybody says Iacocca is the father of the Mustang, absolutely not. Iacocca sold the Mustang to Henry the Deuce and, and got it built, and he's a genius for making that happen. The real father of the Mustang is a guy named Hal Spurlock. He was a product planner at Ford that knew of this, this spot. And then when uh, 
Mr. Don Fry was the chief engineer, thought, well, we'll try to build it on a T-Bird or on a Fairlane, too expensive. It would have never made any money, and it would have been dropped. There, it was Hal Spurlick who locked himself uh, into the engineering department and tried to figure out how to get this beautiful Mustang body onto a Ford Falcon and then therefore make it affordable. So Hal Spurlick and, and I, Coke, and went back to the drawing board after Bunky was summarily booted. And they came up with the Mustang, too. And the reason they did is because they knew the whole world was shifting with Pintos and Vegas and Gremlins. Oh, my. <laughs> and Volkswagen Beetles and everybody was – they were talking about horsepower. Like, How many miles per da- gallon does it get? Forget about $4 a gallon gas. You couldn't buy gas, maybe on odd or even days, if at any price because of the oil embargo. So this was a huge – they took Shelby's and threw them behind the barn. Nobody wanted a big block anything. Well, and that was true. I mean, for all muscle cars, really, of that era, sure. not just not just the Mustang. No, no, no. But but there's here's the, therein lies the problem. So, was Mustang always a muscle car? And that's why it was successful as a, a second gen car because it never was really a Mustang muscle car until this big block came out. The the original sixty five sixty six Mustang, even with the Hypo two eighty nine, was no match for a GTO or a three ninety six Chevelle or a Camaro with a big. You couldn't run against those cars, even with the Hypos and a and a three hundred two. So what did they do? Well, and they put the and then they put a three ninety in it. Well, ask Pasca Ford in Providence, Rhode Island. Guys bought the three ninety Mustang GT, raced the Chevelle, come back, said, "I want my money back." Wilson got <laughs> got his clock lit. So what did he do? Well, he comes up with an idea. Well, we can put police interceptor parts on this. Comes up with a Cobra Jet four twenty eight idea. Tries to sell it to Ford, and they said no. And then what happens? The media, you folks, got involved and started a letter writing campaign. Build the Cobra Jet motor, stick it in the Mustang. And they did, and that's when Mustang became a muscle car. But look, that, that's like 1968, 69, 73 years. And, and so really its pedigree was cute, if you like beautiful. I think it was beautiful. The car was really stylish, looked like nothing else out there. Fun to drive. And a lot of fun to drive, as Smitty, you should know this, is your seating position. And the reason why Mustang was more fun to drive usually than a Camaro, because a Camaro, you sat down in it like a bathtub, especially the current car, boy, and the, where the belt lines up along on your chin. And a Mustang, you sat on it kind of like a horse on a saddle. Outward visibility on a Mustang has always been better than it was on a Camaro. And that gives you a feeling of you're in charge of this horse. You've got the, the, the reins in your hands. And mm-hmm. the, the feeling, the visceral feeling you get of driving these cars was very important. So it had style. It had and it had fun to drive aspect. When the two came out, it was styled like the original. It had setback headlamps, protruding grill, had a little side scoop in it, three bar tail lights. It was much smaller, much lighter, and don't power to weight is all that really mattered. And and let's face it, it people wanted fuel economy, so they gave them a four cylinder. It still had full disc disc brakes. It had rack and pinion steering, so you could throw these little things around. They're a blast to drive, and that fun to drive drove Mustang sales because very few of the Original Mustangs were the big honking muscle car V8s. Most of them were sold or six cylinders of people that just wanted to be cool but couldn't afford it. So I, I wanna I wanna touch on your on your point there really quick about fun to drive because it's really become fashionable. And that's the best way to describe it. It's really become fashionable over the last 20 or so years to trash on the Mustang too. And I bet 99% of the people that do it have never driven one. No. Now, John, certainly you have, and yeah. I have, and actually. I I wrote an article for Motor One a, a few years ago because a Mustang Two came up for sale out here by me, and uh, you know it, it looked pretty decent and it was decently priced. And I contacted you for some advice on what to look for, um, and that's the only article that I still get emails about <laughs> every now and again. And it's like three or four years old from people saying, "Hey, you know, if you're looking for a Mustang Two, I've got this," or people asking me advice about this. Ninety nine percent of the people that trash it have never driven it. And the thing that really shocked me is exactly what you said. It was small. It felt really nimble. It felt light. I felt like, okay, the, the suspension's a little roly poly. Hey, they, there we go on, on YouTube. If you're catching us on YouTube, you can see you can see the article that I wrote a little while ago. 2017. I, 2017. So four years later, I'm still I'm still getting emails about this article. Yeah. People asking questions. And you know what? The the Cobra 2 with the stripes, that big old chin spoiler, the louvers. If you want to send me hate mail, podcast at motorone.com, go ahead and send it to me. You will never conv- convince me that car doesn't all, look all good. All that is is Mustang ignorance. Hate mail about the two is ignorance. It's because 
up when we came out, it was the second best selling Mustang of all time. Three hundred eighty thousand units moved in seventy four, and that's the yeah. one year. That's the one year we didn't have a V eight. The optional motor was a six cylinder. So, and then we listened to enthusiasts. Oh, you can't you can't make a Mustang without a V eight. The very next year we put a V eight in it. We go, oh, it only had one hundred and forty horsepower. What idiot thinks that horsepower is what you feel when you take off? It's torque. It, you, you feel the torque. The well, but, 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 but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Horsepower does matter. Once oh, you get up, well, once does, you get rolling, 19, it does matter. In 1977, the Corvette 350 didn't have, it couldn't even make 250 horsepower. So, you know, 180 or 160 horsepower. Yeah, was, every, everything, everything was everything down was, there. Everything so, was down so, there. And, it's, and because it's power to weight, this car didn't weigh diddly squat. You put a V8 in it, it went, and it made, you know, 90% of its torque at 2,000 RPM. It'll go like scat because that's the and it was the hottest thing out there. You can outrun one of those heavier Camaros when you, and you, they were cheaper. And by the way, uh, I hate to break it to you folks, but you know it sold like gangbusters. So again, it, it did. Cuts, this is what people wanted. They wanted a cool looking, fun to drive car that was affordable, and it still had all of that Mustang flair. Bottom line was, you know, the Cobra Two was. In fact, this year is the uh, 1976 uh, anniversary. And I know um, I've, I started a big mess by starting Mustang two national reunions in Detroit back at the 50th. And this is the sixth year for the reunion. One year we had almost 90 Mustang two shows up in one show. How many people have seen that many? I was imagine working at Ford and being a two fan. It's like you take the biggest abuse from everybody. They they left it out of the the posters and they acted. You can't have six kids and not invite the second one to Christmas. <laughs> especially especially when they when they sold as good as they did. Yeah, it you, was. A, I mean, it was a huge. You know how many Mustang two sold? All, isn't it the second best selling Mustang generation of them all? Yeah, and we figure with one point one. I mean, it's only out for five years. And they cranked them. And then the bottom line was, it was also the higher quality car. This was Iacocca's little jewel. We had new uh, techniques for, for uh, sound deadening, build quality, the way they screwed dashboards. It was the first Mustang with standard disc brakes, rack and pinion steering. I mean, all those. Everything was wrong with a Mustang, too. You could fix with a Ford Racing catalog. A 5.0 is a 5.0. Come on. Yeah. If you can't take this, you know, all right. Oh, you greenies! I'm sorry. I took the smog pump off and I put a four barrel on it. You know, sorry. Maybe I, I did nothing like that on my SN95. Well, well, and the SN95 is a totally cooler. Yeah, let's let's let, let's let's kind of jump. Yeah. So for the reason the reason I did all this, the reason I owned it, you know, I had a '66 convertible and it was a Michigan car, so 90% rust and mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bondo. The car weighed five and a half tons. So you go to a Mustang show and you park next to some guy that's just got a 66 or 65 convertible with every nut and bolt anodized. And he walks away with gold and you walk away with, is it that wavy when you look down the side of my door? <laughs> you know? So I said, why am I buying first gen Mustangs? You can't compete in this world. Second gens by that time, a 69 or a 70 Mach one, my favorite car were out of touch because their big block power was insane. I couldn't afford them. And so when I, you know, when I got married, my, my wife said, you know, buy one, buy a car that is cool. And that was the coolest thing, the Mustang 2 Cobra 2. So I went, I said, you know, I'm going to buy a Mustang 2. Guess what? My first show, I bought a King Cobra when I was at SVT. I went to my first show and I took a, a gold medal, a prize for having a King Cobra. Probably the only one there. You're the yeah. only guy there. You're going to win trophies that other guys couldn't <laughs> win. With. And I, do, do, I was, do you see these trophies behind me? Yeah. What, what, where do you yeah. think they came from? Because I'm in the SN95 category right. with like with like two other cars. Yeah, and then and then you can you know tell people you can educate them. You know, well, you know, Edsel Ford the second tried to get some pizzazz into the Mustang II, and in 1976, Ford Division came out with a, a car called the Mustang II Stallion. They also had it in Pinto and Maverick Stallions for '76. It was a appearance package, a blackout package, and and they told Edsel, don't bother with this thing with getting getting Carol's permission to use the word Cobra and going to a Motor Town aftermarket company to make them Cobra II because it's not going to sell. Well, guess what? They didn't tell him he was going to give it to ABC and 60 million people on Thursday night saw Charlie's Angels. Charlie's and Angels. Farrah yes. Fawcett Majors drive that white, the one with the blue stripes. 26,000 orders flooded in for the Cobra 2. Motortown couldn't handle it. They had to take the program in-house in 1977. So, yeah, I have a 77 Cobra 2 T-top V8 Air, a California car, 50,000 miles. It's in the Mustang Museum, uh, the Halderman Museum in Dayton. I've got another one, which was my first. New Mustang was a 78 Cobra II, a billboard car. That's been a 25-year restoration story, which is a horror story from all horror stories. Plus, I have an 06. I love S197s. 
So I have an 06 modded S197 with uh, cams and a shaker and uh, drop suspension. I got to ask, do you still have the Pinto wagon? I had that, thing was, up, that thing was I, awesome. I had it up until last year when I got an offer I couldn't refuse. Pintos are through the roof now in collectability. Hmm. Um, back well, when I bought it. Not, there aren't any left. They all rest. <laughs> well, they're the big lighters. Or they blew up, right? Well, that's another fallacy. Actually, Pintos yeah, yeah. the safer. If you, the Harvard study in the, in the late 80s proved all that to be, that was the first fake news of all time with Mother Jones News. Pinto was in the 56 percentile. It was actually safer. More people died in a in a Volkswagen Beetle and a Chevy Nova fire than in a Pinto in that 10 years that happened. But because of fake news, it got black eyed and the car was actually safer than most small cars on the market in that area. And they sold 3 million of those things. Yeah. So hey, 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 again, story. <laughs> again so John, real quick, I got to ask you, is this the ferret faucet image that you were referring to earlier? Yeah, that's the one that was uh, it was taken. They had to black out the Cobra in the grill. She took the plate off. A guy that's not Ferris Car from the movie. She was taping at the uh, Speedway out there in L.A. And they he he brought his car in and got her to sit on the hood. He took that photo, and it is. I mean, it's if you're a fair, if you're a two fan and you have a Cobra two. My Cobra two is uh, white with red stripes. They made him white okay. with blue. But that's the that's the photo. That's okay. the one everybody. That's the don't one. don't zoom in too close on that photo, Bruce. We might get <laughs> I, I'll be right back. I have to go lay down for a while. <laughs> well, let's jump forward a little bit because I want to talk a little bit about SN95 because I have an SN95. Um, well, before, and, you do that, before you do that, okay. let's understand. Okay, you know, my, Fox body, and I also yeah. kind of have a question. Mustang so. 2 didn't, it only lasted five years as opposed to every other Mustang except right. for Fox. So Fox took those extra five years. How did that happen? So the only reason I wrote a Mustang book, look, look behind me. I've got, I've got 200 Mustang books. I think I've read... Most of these people that have written these books are friends of mine. I know most all of these authors in the last 25 years, they, and they're all great books, but they're all pretty much the same. And nobody worked at Ford. So when I got there, I thought, well, I got to find out. Every Mustang generation has a mystery about it, and I had to find out every single one has a mystery. And I had to, I, So I went at my first book, Mustang Dynasty, was all about solving that. And, and mm. the problem with the two, too, I wanted to give it its due. Mm -hmm. But when the Fox came about, how in the heck did we have this Mustang that went up until 73 and then out comes a Mustang too with kind of like the same styling cues that Gail Halderman and Joe Oros put on that car from the original. And then all of a sudden in 79, when the Fox came out, we get this slab sided, smooth, door completely slide. different. Yeah. How completely did that different. happen? So, and you can ask Jack Telnack, who's still around, even though he didn't actually design it, he was the VP of design then. And, and here's what happened. I'll give you this, and I'm not going to tell you the rest because otherwise no one will buy my book, which is out of print. So, so we'll have we'll have links in the article. We'll have Deuce, links. Hank the Deuce hated Lee Iacocca so much. He fired him in '78. He disliked this man so much because he thought he wanted to be bigger than Ford. That when he fired him, he went down to look at some of the designs for the '79 Mustang. And Gail Holderman himself, I became friends with him. I hung with him for ten years before he passed last April. And he told me he brought them down for the review. Telnac was already VP of design. They, and Deuce comes down. He says, "Here, he's our, and he said, here's my 79 Mustangs. And know what he said to Gail Halderman? Those look like Iacocca Mustangs. <laughs> That's what he said. And so he, act, he looks at, to Telnac and he says, uh, what about you? You're the new. He's, well, I, here's what I think the 79 should look like. And he shows a fox body. And you know what Deuce said? Oh, yeah, that's the, all right, that's the 79 Mustang. So he picked it because it looked nothing like what he saw in his mind as an Iacocca Mustang mm -hmm. with the traditional styling cues. And Jack's, you know, Jack did work on the original. He worked on the wheel cover for the, the 65, 66. And he said he did such a great job because that was the most stolen wheel cover in 65. <laughs> so and that's a true story. You can ask Telnac himself. So Mustang Fox body was a left turn in Fox, in Mustang design. And mm -hmm. it took a long, and by the way, the, the least his, uh, horsepower in Mustang history is not the Mustang 2. It's not the small block 302 that was choked to death with 130 horsepower. It was the Fox body 255 that mm -hmm. was a 302 that was choked to death. Had the yeah. lowest horsepower number of any Mustang. It was a Fox body. And People, oh, well, they forget that they thought the Fox came out of the gate, you know, selling like gangbusters. People really liked the, the pace car, which is why the 79 pace car got a lot of those design cues got moved ahead into the later Fox generations. Try to find a 79 or an 80 Cobra with the uh, crazy snake on that hood. You want to do I, I think 
yeah, it, it's it took a long time, I think, for the foxes to really pick up well, some steam. You know, you, you can't engineer horsepower and, and, and emissions at the same time. So it took a long time for the fox. I mean, there was still the car was different, and that's what helped it, it sold, except to a lot of purists didn't jump on it. Do you know the MC, MCA would not, not allow fox body Mustangs at the Mustang shows with the Mustang Club of America? They wouldn't allow them. They really? Didn't, yeah. Why? Because they didn't, they didn't think they were Mustangs. They don't look like a Mustang. I mean, they didn't allow them in the club. It, the club ended at 73. So when this car came out, you know, it, they, they test a uh, test bed of a lot of things, but that's why that those extra five years, it took uh, an engineering miracle to get the bosses back. Remember when the GT came back? Well, guess what? If you could just, you know, legislate something, we'd, we'd tomorrow legislate the end of cancer and we'd be done with it, but <laughs> you can't do that. So it took a long time to try to get performance back while we yeah. met fuel economy and emission standards, which were two things fighting against each other. When they, we finally got that, remember the dual snorkel 50 HO? I do. Yeah. Remember we got that baby back? We started to be horseball. Well, guess what? By now, a whole new generation of young people didn't identify with anything but a 50. So when Ford tried to put a cheese grater on the back taillights and charge you more for a GT, what did the enthusiasts do? No, we like the LX notchback. We don't want all that crap on it. We just want the 50 yeah. and the manual. And a notchback, and then it was sold. It was so amortized by then, it was so cheap. You know, you get them for twelve grand, and it was a super hot ride. So the enthusiasts again told Ford, you know, this is what we want. Don't you know? That's why those right now an LX five liter notchback that's been unmolested. Try to find one um, is going to get more than a GT or a convertible because that's what people love. So that car went through a long iteration of change, very gradual. To try to become, you know, uh, something special. And by the time SVT came around, the '93, the last Fox, we decided, hey, let's make this thing go out with a bang and make a Cobra. Of course, right here in my office, I wish I could show you. I have the actual name of the '93 Fox SVT car was not called a Cobra. So what was it? Well, I don't know if I, don't know if I want to. I want to it's called the GT. <laughs> it's called the GT Plus. I actually have a rendering of GT it Plus. The it was the GT Plus. And the reason I, did, I did, didn't know that. Yeah, we had to take Cobra because the Cobra name was going away. The Cobra GT was in Canada and mm -hmm. it was going away because the new 94 was coming out, wouldn't carry that nomenclature. So they came to us and said, Can you put the Cobra name on your special Mustang? Because we're going to lose it out of the Canadian Cobra GT. And we said, Yeah. And then that's when we got this truck that Ford Division walked over with. And I said, What's the name of that truck? And they said, It's the F 150 Performance Pickup. Oh, <laughs> what a great name! So we called it the Lightning. Lightning. So, let's let's Lightning. talk about let's talk about SVT more a little no, bit. So, so that's how Fox came out. I mean, it, right. it, a whole generation of people identify with the five O. That's where we get roll into my five O. That's mm -hmm. where it came from, and that's why v today, Vanilla Ice. I I wrote a whole series for another magazine based on rolling in my five point oh. Yeah, well, that's but for a lot of us. That wasn't my generation, you know. So I you know, I was making babies at the time and working two jobs. So. Rolling my 50 is fine, but SVT, what a cool idea. I mean, come on, a niche group of a, bunk, a skunk works within a big company like Ford to come up with only enthusiast product. And oh, by the way, not to just throw stripes on stuff. In fact, it would be the opposite. Don't put any money in it unless it's functional. You know? Well, I tell you what, I tell you what, John, let's 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 get to, to bruce's question because bruce had a question like 20 minutes ago i say <laughs> do and it, it goes back <laughs> you now have to go back decades i'm about ready to take a shot of hot sauce here to try to slow you down <laughs> so John, i don't know when i'm going to talk tough. to you again but this is something i've always heard and it's something i've always been curious about and it goes back to the very beginning of mustang like the very very beginning and that is that Robert McNamara, who was the head of Ford at the time, and Lee Iacocca butted heads over the Mustang. And the version of the story I have been told is that because McNamara went and worked for the John F. Kennedy administration since he left and was no longer advocating for the Falcon, that that was one of the things that helped Iacocca push for the Mustang to get made. That is, I, a whole, is that a fair uh, argument? Is it, like, where would you go with that? It's a hundred percent true that that was a roadblock for him. But what, what also happened was when he became president of Ford Division, he asked his daughter, "I'm president. What would you like? To, I'll get your car. What would you like?" And she said, "Nothing, Daddy." <laughs> this is McNamara saying this. No, this is Iacocca's daughter. Oh, Iacocca. Okay, sorry. 
And because he said, well, McNamara is going to the Kennedy administration. Now I can he's going to try to and he hired Hal Spurlick, which is really, in my opinion, the last true American automobile company genius there is. He created the pony car, he mm -hmm. a segment. He created that segment in his head. He created the front drive subcompact, which we now know as the Fiesta, and then uh, for Ford when it was not approved. That got him fired. And he also created the minivan, which did not get approved at Ford as well because they thought wow, it was a good idea. idea. So, so Hal Spurlick and I Coco sit down, and he goes back. He says, my daughter doesn't want anything. He goes, what does she want? She wanted a Chevy Corvair Monza. That's what she wants. She thought that was cool. That was so my mom's then, dream car too. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so well, and forget what Ralph Nader said. It was a great little car. Yeah, and um, you know, it may have launched his career, but it didn't really that launch that many other people into outer space. But the problem was, <laughs> lots of people. They now it. had this belief <laughs> that if we make this sporty, youthful car that beaut that's really cool looking, and it's got bucket seats and a stick shift, and it's not all dumbed down. People say to me all the time, hey, did you you know, Mr. Clore, you know a lot about Mustangs, that the Barracuda beat the Mustang to market? Yes, I know it came out in March. The Mustang came out in April. Well, why why is it called a pony car then? Why isn't it uh, the fish car? Fishy car. <laughs> yeah. Why did Mustang put the Barracuda in the weeds when it came out? And I mean, nobody even talked about it for years. I'll tell you why. Because they're both built on a basic economy car, the Mustang on the Falcon, which, you know, looked like a droopy piece of pie. Compared hey, to I like the Falcon Future. I, 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 I do a Falcon Sprint convertible in a minute, but the but compared to a Mustang, it ain't it. Sure. So the Barracuda, unfortunately, had the, the front, the back end was fastback. Mm -hmm. You could get a stick shift, bucket seats with the cool taillights, but, but the front end was a Valiant, and yeah. the Valiant was your grandmother's car. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much you liked your grandmother, other than she might have smelled different, but <laughs> nobody wanted to drive their grandmother's car. Right. Mustang didn't do that. Now, they may have the very early cards, what they call the 64 and a half, which aren't any. There's no such thing. Every first generation Mustang has a 65 in. But the ones who were early builds, of 64 and a half, oh, they, they had Falcon instrument panels. Yeah. We, it took a little while to get all of that Falconness out. The best line is uh, Haldeman, who said he designed the three taillights. If you look at those clays, Smitty, that we were talking about, uh, one side is the Haldeman side with a scoop on it, and the other one looked like an Oldsmobile. It was Joe Oros's. Haldeman picked the Haldeman design, and he said he couldn't use those three taillights. And the Cougar, you'll notice in the in the corral of the original Mustang, it was a cat. Mm -hmm. They yep. called it the Cougar. And the and I and Haldeman couldn't believe they weren't going to give him the three taillights. He's like, that's a really in, in, interesting part. I got to have them. They said you can't. He said why not? They said the Falcon has one bulb. <laughs> so. The 65 Mustang got one lens, the three little silver squares painted on it. it wasn't until 67 when they redesigned the car that I that Halderman could get his three tail lamps. Huh. And those are the kinds of things that they, they really knew what they wanted. Iacocca knew if he could, you know, the truth is, and Spurlock would not tell me for years until just a few years ago, that they lied about the research that they needed to show Mr. Ford to get the Mustang funded because he didn't want another car. This is right after the Etzel came out. I don't want another new stupid car. No, no, it's not happening. And a lot of people at the company hated the project, thought it was dumb, but these people were so passionate and they, they were so sure because they're, they were tied to the kids. Again, the people that who would buy it, mm -hmm. young people. And you know what? The young people just weren't the ones that bought it. It was everybody that bought it. It's like, you know, when they built that Pontiac Aztec, Oh, we'll send it to young kids. Teachers bought it. Yeah. Retirees bought it. And that's why I think when you talk about that original, yeah, McNamara was out of the way, but Iacocca was so sure about Spurlock's ideas that, and, 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 you know, they didn't, there wasn't a lot of research. It was, what are they, what kind of feedback did they get from real people? And, mm -hmm. and that to me was the make or break point of the original Mustang. It's why he went that route on Mustang too. And with Fox body, he was gone by this time. And it took a long time for engineering to get catch up with, but it created a new generation of lovers. And by the time Fox had run its course, did you know, Miss Smitty, your SN95 was it's a like Fox. A, it's a Fox it's underneath. A lot of Fox. Well, well, we call it Fox 4, but it, you were a, one sneeze away from getting canceled. You were. It was done. Oh, I know. You know. John Coletti, who was the program manager on that car, and Bud Nagaldi drew it. But Coletti was put over in a Montgomery Ward warehouse, not far from world's headquarters to, to have a skunk works team to see if he could save the car. It was done. They already went to get build this Mazda design front wheel drive probe and call that the Mustang. 
Well, there was some stalwarts that said, you can't do that. We got to have an American built, American designed V8 powered Mustang. And they basically were put in this building and said, if you don't come out of here on time, under budget with something we like, done. Mustang's gone. Or it's a probe. And really, with, you, I mean, you see pictures of the probe well, body with, with the Mustang running with, pony in it. it I mean, I, I think everybody knows that story, but maybe you can shed a little bit of extra light as to yeah. how close okay. it, Here's it, a actually, it actually got. All right, everybody knows the story. Then who was it that, that said no? It was already built. Clay was done. Engineering was done. The front fascia had a pony the in story, it. The, the story goes, there's the massive writing campaign that's, that told Ford, no, we don't want our Mustang to be a front-wheel drive car. We want it to be a rear-wheel drive car. And Ford listened. That's that's kind of the, I think, the generally known story. Yeah, that's the one that people claim that they think they had the power over that. But the problem is they didn't see that car. And they, they didn't, this car was way well done before they even hinted that that was going to be the Mustang. It was already down the road. It was finished. So Roletta writing campaign after you're done with the car, good luck. You needed somebody at the vice president, president or CEO level to kill a car that's been all the way through production like that. And you know who it was? Nobody knew who it was. And nobody would tell me. I mean, so when I wrote my book, I was going to find out it was not Bill Ford Jr. It was not John Coletti. It was not uh, the design team. It was not Art Hyde, who did 99% of the engineering on that car as the chief. It wasn't those people. They didn't want it, but they can't put it in and say, no, you can't do it. Well, for God's sakes, don't tell us because people need to buy your book. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was the vice president. And and it only he had and he said that's a great car. It's not a Mustang. Call it something else. And they called it the Probe. Sold it anyway because the money was sunk. Mm-hmm. And it was up to Coletti with no budget to come up with SN95 and Emmeline King who did the interior of those two humps. And she was she went to Wayne State University like I did in Detroit. She was a young black uh, female designer that just nailed that interior. Bud McGaldy, you know about the three clays that came out and they picked that mm-hmm. one. Uh, these. You can't make this stuff up. And and when it came out, the Mustang world embraces it because, look, it's got set pack headlines, little patrolling grill. It's got the scoop pack in it. But what didn't it have, guys? It, it didn't it had, have the, the three-bar taillights. It had three back. horizontal it, taillights. It, 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 still had the, it still had the cheese graters, if you will. It took two years for Ford to, to stop stop screaming at Ford and put make the bezel with upright, uh, you know, Vertical yep. tail. And, and we asked Bud McGaldy, who drew that car, who drew the SN95, the 94, 95 car. And we asked him flat out, why didn't you do that? And he says, does everything have to be so purist? I did it because if you look at the <laughs> upper body line of an SN95, you'll see it, it continues right through the tail lamps. It's a more clean design. The, yeah, the- you know what? I, I have a 95 and I don't see that. And in fact, I didn't see it to the point where I actually upgraded to 96 taillights. See, there you go. So you're a purist. So these stories can't be made up because th- what happened each time is the enthusiast spoke up, said, no, I, I, no, no, this is what we want. And to your credit, it might take them a little while, Ford listened. They listened to these people. And, and luckily for us, I happen to know that over a series of chief engineers, they too weren't just engineers. There's a lot of these engineers, you know, they got nice pocket protectors, but they're, no offense, they're nerds. You know, I know you. They're sorry to. Um, yeah, they, they don't have you, cool robots behind them like I do. All you nerds out there, don't get angry with me. <laughs> Go back to living in your mom's basement and playing video games. Bottom line is, these guys were Mustang people too, and the mm-hmm. engineers knew darn well. You know, they used to ask us at SVT, "Well, how do you know it's cool? Have you done any research? No. Well, how do you know it's enthusiasts will like it? We said we are enthusiasts. We lo- we know they like it because they are us. And this is cool. It, that is lame. And we, we were able to say that because all of us were, look, I was pulled off from a Buff Book magazine to be on a Skunk Works group. We were mercenaries to come out with the products that just hit those buttons. And, you know, SVT wound up being the longest running, best selling. Well, let's niche let, group let's let, let's talk about that a little bit, um, because I think now is, is a pretty good time for a segue, because we're talking about Mustang enthusiasts. Um when when you go to shows, I mean, SVT Special Vehicle Team, it's almost it, it's almost gospel for some people. Um, and you were there for its heyday. You started there in '95. You saw it all the way through. Um, d- did you did you know that technically I was hired for the SVT program right just as it was canceled? 
the, the, back, back in the in, in the Campbell day. I mean, that's that, that's how that's how I got to know John was oh, uh, was I, I was hired in. I was going to be part of the you know the the SVT marketing program, and that was I think right at the the tail end of two thousand five. Yeah, and, and then and then I got a call in you know like the like January third of two thousand six. Oh yeah, sorry, Ford is mainstreaming the program, so the job we hired you for no longer exists. But I, I mean, I ended up getting kind of in, involved anyways. But let's, I mean, let's talk about what SVT means and and tell us. Some, I mean, there are some just amazing stories. I've heard some of these, just some amazing stories of what was going on there to make some of these vehicles happen. And there are also so many vehicles that would have been amazing that didn't happen. I mean. I mean, just, just run wild here for a little bit, but not too well, long because we're we're getting pretty long already. Let's ask the question: Why SVT? I mean, you know, Mustang was Mustang, and to answer that question, by the time the Bullet came out and the, the first Bullet and the the Mach One and those cars, Mustang by that time, uh, by the late SN95 years, was upside down. It was not make, making any money. Art Hyde will tell you that until they put the, the shakers to the mock stereo system in the cars, they were actually loss leaders. They just like going mm-hmm. to buy milk at, at 7-Eleven. That's, you know, we, we could not make money on Mustang. And and so it's gonna, that's that's death knell for any car. You don't make money, you're a Camaro. You're done. Yeah. So it was gone. So how do we generate interest? Well, you can't count on no no offense to the guys at mainstream. You can't count on Ford Division because their answer was like, well, let's put stripes on it. Wow. <laughs> or you know, some of you used to tell me, I really you shouldn't be on the team. You have fake scoops on your coat Mustang too. I said that is a lie. Those are not fake scoops. Those are real scoops. They're not functional. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. They're not functional. Not functional. But those are real scoops. Now, at SVT, the money was not spent on anything that wasn't functional. So we didn't have, you know, a lot of fake stuff that I, what they called fake. I mean, if you could, if it didn't make it go faster or look better, we're not interested. So well, wasn't there, wasn't there a fight quite a while about keeping the wheel size down? Because the bigger wheels you have, the more parasitic loss you're going to get. So it's like, we're not going to put 20 inch wheels on the car. We're going to stick. I, I think the 0304 Cobra still had 17 inch wheels. Yeah. Well, see, and then therein lies the battle with what, why SVO failed and why SVT didn't. SVO is a bunch of engineers who, you know, went and did the parts catalog. And so we can make a Mustang out of these parts and engineers, they called it the car that sells itself. Well, guess what? <laughs> Nothing sells itself. Nope. SVOs were in the same uh, showroom and next to a Mustang GT was cheaper. And he had to explain why it has the five lugs and the wing on it and the Recaro seats and a turbo, which makes similar horsepower. But why is it more money? And you're buying this car from a guy that wore lime green pants and a white belt. So don't ever do that. The, nope. the enthusiasts knew more about an SVO Mustang than the salespeople did. So we learned early on, if you're going to do a, a performance car in Ford, Just go to performance dealers, have specially trained dealers who know the performance customer who are a pain in the rear because they're much more discerning and they'll pay for a premium price for a premium car. But let's make sure that the people who sell this car and who develop it are enthusiasts first and foremost. So there were four hallmarks of SVT performance. If it doesn't have a better motor or a unique engine, it's, it's nothing. It's just, you know, it's like the King Cobra had the same 302 that you put in your Gia. It's got to have a different motor. Mm-hmm. Substance. The money has to go into brakes or, or, or exhaust or hardware. Exclusivity. You don't want to see every one of these Cobras on every street corner because everybody's got one. So you only sell a few of them. How many do you sell? One fewer than people want. <laughs> Try doing that. And the last one was value. Cletty used to say anybody can sell you a $50,000 Mustang. That goes like stink. Try to sell you a $30,000 Mustang that goes like stink from the factory with a factory warranty. And that was our challenge. So SVT was created basically by Bob Rui, who was the VP of marketing and and the chief engineer of all of Ford was Neil Ressler. And they wanted to do this cross-functional group outside the goal. Don't use the guys in the company. Use people. They found us everywhere, every nook and cranny. John Plant, our chief, our marketing manager, was from BMW. He didn't want to, well, you know, let's be like Celine in a Fox uh, Mustang, the racecraft suspension. Let's crank it up so you're driving over bricks. Cobras were about supple ride and handling, not just super stiff, knock your teeth out. It was mm-hmm. how do you get handling in a car that you can actually turn a corner and not roll over, but but make it stick. 
All those things were the big challenges of taking a car that was built at the old Dearborn assembly plant, where when you walked in, you could see Model T bolts still pushed into the wood floor <laughs> and, and build it at that plant and build a car with a premium price tag and premium performance. So to me, I thought it was the coolest idea ever. I left Auto Week to come there, um, launch a performance brand. And now, yeah. how, how cool is that? When is that ever going to happen? And to be autonomous, we had our own press fleet, our own communications team. We, we did not sit at Ford. We're off with the agency. And we had cool the coolest engineers in the company because they're all crazy. They were all, <laughs> and why did I leave? And, you know, when I could have flown, flown to Europe and driven BMW convertibles, why did I come to Ford? Because my buddy, Jim Sawyer, who you know, Smitty, was the, yep. the PR manager, would come over to my house with weird stuff that SVT was doing, like, Escort turbos, Cosworth <laughs> turbos, and you know they put like a yep. show motor in a Ranger pickup. And a, who are these guys? Like that's cool. I, I was enamored with that. So being communications, the, the internet came along, and being the first person on my website, svt.4.com, you know, three and a half million visitors. When the Terminator came out, more than one and a half million people downloaded our brochure off the internet with their own ink. Think of the money we oh. saved for it because we couldn't <laughs> keep Terminator or SVT catalogs in stock at the dealership. There were you know, collectors took them. I mean, these are this is the kind of frenzy that we created. And and because we had a guy like Coletti, you know, plant left and came, then was Tim Boyd, and then eventually uh, Tom Scarpello, who now runs Vivology Cars. Uh, Tom Scarpello does. And Coletti was, you know, he's the one that saved the Mustang with SN95. He knew how to make programs work. But he was a he was a rock and roll cowboy. He he was lead follower, get out of the way. The stories I could tell you about how he got stuff done, totally illegal. If you would, if, if <laughs> he didn't have Neil Ressler, vice president of Ford, protecting him from getting fired at least a dozen times that I know of, uh, we wouldn't have built these cars. But that's what it's the passion that drove SVT. That's why I was so enamored with it. And the only reason I was still around after you left Smitty and F SVT was disbanded. Wrestler retired, Rui retired, and they moved. Uh, the new manager at Ford thought we were a bunch of crazy cowboys making stuff that is should be illegal, and they didn't see the why. Why don't you sell fifty thousand SVT focuses instead of, you know, five thousand? Because mm -hmm. it's not about that. They didn't get it. They, they're it's, it's, guys. it's the halo car. The five thousand yeah. SVT focuses that we sell will get you eighty thousand regular focuses. That's what they couldn't. The, the, that that little. Yep carried in the showroom they didn't get it so when they kicked everybody out and they, they demoted coletti he he retired um and the whole thing was disbanded i was in disbelief that ford had this really cool uh, innovative niche group that could have been the way the company should have been run and yet they they ate their young once once you kill the golden goose i hate to break it to you all the golden eggs are gone <laughs> oh no yeah yeah. So, so you well, mean the hundred thousand dollar GT five hundred isn't a golden egg? Yeah. So, well, it is, but the problem is, so a lot of these guys wound up. You know, I wound up at racing only because they didn't realize the SVT website was the only place you get information about the GT five hundred. Oh, by the way, the 07 GT five hundred. That's the 06 SVT Mustang Cobra. Yep. That wasn't done by Carol Shelby. That was done by Ellen Collins. She was well, a and, and, and it had an IRS, wrong. and that car was supposed to be exported as an S one ninety five. So people but, didn't know all of this because those cars never came to market, like the SVT Adrenaline concept or the the second the PN PN two twenty one Lightning. If that thing yep. was the Cool Eddy uh, Cold Air, oh, if that thing would have been built, I mean, these things were the SVT Thunderbird, uh, the MN twelve, the SVT Expedition, the SVT V eight Ranger. Holy cow! I would have. When I drove the V8 Ranger with a manual transmission, Cobra powertrain, I almost just decided to drive it to Mexico, paint it flat black, and, <laughs> and never come back. And, and just stay there. That, yeah, that car, that truck was, it was an ungodly street truck. So those stories, hopefully someday will be told when, you know, people won't get fired. I still work at Ford, so I want to be able to. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't want you to get in trouble. But yeah. so, Sorry, you piqued my interest here, just super quick. Uh -oh. SVT Thunderbird. That wasn't just going to be the AG or AJ V8 from uh, Jaguar with the supercharger. That there was more than that, or oh god, yes, yeah. We used a Cobra powertrain, put it in there, manual transmission with a floor shift, huh? In an MN12 with our suspension tuning, and when we first got the first red one, we did a prototype. We built it. Uh, I remember Tom Bohannon, who's the chief engineer on it, and he came back. We built a red one and a black one. 
We had enough parts to do a third one. There may be, I think the uh, plant manager may have assembled one himself. But with that motor in it, uh, it, it the marketing people didn't think it looked cool enough. So we took a, a, a rear spoiler off. I think it was off a of show Taurus and put it on the back of that MN12 and, you know, change the front face with the fog light. And when I drove that thing around, that was the, I mean, there, say what you will about the turbo coupes and super coupes. So they're all great T-Birds. But that MN12 T-Bird, SVT Thunderbird, was so cool. And when we got the, 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 the bad word that was going to be canned, we tried to resurrect it as a Dale Hearn, Earnhardt edition because we found out MN12 only had one year left before it was going away. We thought, what a great, you know, exclamation point on the MN12. And we still couldn't get it built for that because of the, you know, investment mm -hmm. of the powertrain. And don't forget, if we can't do the powertrain, we're not going to do it because we were SVT. It's not a sticker special. You know, it's not, it's not going to just be stickers because we saw a lot of these Monte Carlos with SS on it. And that was they, they had the supercharged 3800, but I mean, you yeah. can get the supercharged 3800 in the Regal GS and, and yeah. a lot of other cars. I mean, I'm a fan of that engine, but yeah, the me too. Me we, too. We, I, we don't want to talk about NASCAR because that could, that could end very badly no, no, that for was, me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got it. I know I drove the Typhoon at Auto Week. I, you know, I understand those, those, those vehicles and they had a good thing going there for a while, but again, you got to be able to sustain it with a, a, a vehicle line that uses the technology you pioneered, gives it to mainstream and you move on. And that was the idea behind the Terminator. You know, we were going to, we were going to go with that motor and we used our Cobra V8 and our, and our brakes and we gave it to the Mach 1 and they wanted to increase sales by saying, well, the one thing you don't do is offer an automatic. So we'll put an automatic in it. So we trickled down the Cobra motor and our brakes, and you can use it with the auto. And then we moved up to Terminator and our bigger brakes and IRS and those things. And that was the whole idea. But when new management came in and thought the whole thing was silly, doesn't matter how good you are. And that was uh, it. That was it. And so I wound up racing only because I was still running the website. And I knew I had limited time because once I gave it over to uh, Team Detroit or what do they call it, uh, J. Walter Thompson, I was gone. So mm -hmm. then I, that's where I came up with the idea. So, well, wait a minute. We had the SVT Owners Association. We took 20,000 names from that. People, there was a magazine at racing called Inside the Oval. And when they said they had to kill the Owners Association, they couldn't, there was no money to refund everybody their $40 membership. So I said, hey, I volunteer. I'll put SVT Enthusiast Magazine content in your racing magazine. It'll be Inside the Oval now, including SVT Enthusiast. So that bought me a whole year. Then I had to figure out when they came to me and said, Inside the Oval Magazine's dead at racing. What am I going to do? Well, that's why I came up with the idea. I said, don't – the parts managers, man, I don't want to kill that magazine. The people who buy, who are enthusiasts, buy most of the Ford racing parts. That's just mm -hmm. the way it is. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose them. So he said – I said, well, don't – when you kill your – don't say we're killing the magazine. Say instead of a print magazine, instead of 12 of those, we'll give you 52 email newsletters. And I volunteered to do it. So that's how fast news from Ford racing – began and that's so now it's called fast news from ford performance and at one time we had a half a million opt-ins so that's the only reason i'm still at ford and then by the time <laughs> by the time this all trickled down they realized holy cow these these enthusiasts they'll buy high-end cars if you treat them right if you interact with the clubs they're like a they're like a whole world of of, of of disciples who go forth and preach the ford gospel at the water cooler right oh, well let's 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 talk just a just a little bit about that because we got some other things we want to get to. I mean, five minutes, John. Kind of tell us what you're doing and the connections that are being made with the enthusiasts that are really kind of driving the Ford hobby right now, and 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 kind of the connections that are being made there on the enthusiast side. Right well, before we kind of talk yeah. you, something about Mustang Connect. That's something you're working on now. No, it's actually called Club Connect. Oh, I'm Club sorry. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, Mustangs are you know like ninety percent of it. But don't forget, every Ford vehicle has. I can't think of a Ford vehicle that doesn't have a club. You know, we we have seven hundred and eighty clubs that we know of, and I mm -hmm. and my Club Connect. Uh, Ford, if you go to FordPerformanceClubConnect.com, look on the map. I think we have over four hundred clubs and Facebook pages registered. But that what was that. What, what was that? Hold on. What was that link again? It was FordPerformanceClubConnect.com. Okay, and we'll have that link in the in the YouTube description. Yeah, so if you go to that website, first of all, you see fast news from Ford Performance there every Thursday, so you don't have to get the email. You'll read it for free, and we want you to steal the information and put it on your own websites and share it. 
The other thing is you'll see, man, I just bought a show Taurus. Is there a show Taurus club around here? You go on the map and you find out where all the clubs are. And then it gives you contact information, how many people. And so the idea was we got to connect these people together because back when I started doing this, you know, when we did the uh, uh, Fiesta ST, guess what? There were two ST clubs for 40 miles from each other in Seattle. They didn't even know each other existed. And once we put them on the map, they go, holy cow, if we call these guys, they'll come to our show. We'll have 80 cars instead of 40. So th those were the funny things that we learned. And we also, Ford as a company, learned that enthusiasts are powerful. These people not only, you know, some marketing guys, oh, they haven't bought a Mustang since 65. That might be true but they have seven Fords in their family. They're pulling it with an F-250 Super Duty. Their wife drives an Edge. Their kid drives an Escape. These people have four, five, six, seven Mustangs in their, or seven Fords in their driveways, and they are brand disciples, which you can't buy. You know, Toyota went crazy when they found out about this club thing when Malali came on. They go, how can we get an army of people who just go forth and at the water cooler tell you to got to buy a Ford. I mean, uh, they, they wanted that for Toyota. Everybody wants it. So we have it. So the question is, how do we how do we leverage it? What good is heritage? What good is uh, an army of enthusiasts unless you can leverage it? So my job has been to communicate with them, to support them, to go to their events, to give them what they need to be successful, to help them be successful, and to pr use the marketing power of Ford to promote them. So when people buy a Ford, they don't just buy a, a car, they buy a lifestyle. And they can tap into this hobby and learn all about this car that why it's not just a machine. Uh, they're going to develop a relationship to the point where, I hate to say this, guys, but some people actually pull their Mustang into the garage and they close the door and they walk three steps and they turn around, they look at it and they go, good night, Betsy. <laughs> yeah. so, some, pe that. some people some people do that we do that. I just for the record I, i'm not one of them i'm not okay, gonna, I, i'm not it, quite that far yet well it's that it's that connection we've we this piece of steel we, we built in so much um visceral feedback the driving this car this fun to drive ability of a car and so my job is to connect with them so how do we do that well i've got fordperformance.com which has its own enthusiast section when you go there you click on enthusiast and what is that about I don't sell anything there. I just talk about you. I talk about my owners, my clubs, this my events. That's all I do. And guess what? That's all it is. Fan spotlight. Everybody who owns a Ford can be in the fan spotlight. And it's not like your club is bragging about your car. It's Ford Motor Company. So and then I have a yeah. 1-800 Ford SVT. It's actually 1-800 Ford 788. Can't say SVT anymore. It's the same yeah. number that Chris same answered, number that Chris answered 20 years ago. And it's not some fast food headset phone jockey like, hello, this is Bob. Wait, wait, that wasn't 20 years ago, John. Come on, I'm not that freaking old here, man. Yeah, well, maybe it's your haircut. No. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I, I, my I'm hair was brown hair dye. No, these are real guys <laughs> like Chris. They're real. I mean, Steve Horn's got a 600 horsepower Falcon. And, and, and you know, some of the, one of the guys that is on the call center built my 302 for my last yeah. too. And it's like, it's, it goes lumpity dumpity 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 do. So, and, and you know, I've I've kind of nosed around. I, I'm I'm neutral party these days, but I have no, I have nosed around for like you know Chevrolet, Mopar. I I've never really found quite the same thing. I got to give Ford some credit here. I've never found quite the same thing, quite the same level of engagement that you're doing on your end with Ford Performance and and the clubs there. Well, and GM, you know, it, it's 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 pretty impressive. I know GM GM they, does have a thing going on. Yeah, and they did a fuel newsletter for a while, but the problem with fuel, and we only got it monthly, I do mine weekly. And the problem with that is they started selling you stuff. It was press releases. You don't you don't sell your enthusiasts on stuff. They're already your fans. So you don't try to sell them stuff. So I so fuel went away and then they they do the good guy shows and the big good Corvette Na or the Corvette Nationals and you know, they do all that. But here's where we're different. So Ford will go to Tulsa and the Carlisle Nationals and the big the bring trailer. We'll do all that stuff. But here's what we do differently. We have a Ford Performance Club Connect Transit, and it's got a tent in it and ten thousand posters and a bunch of free stuff. So if you're Joe Schmuck and you live in Clinton, Illinois, and your Ford dealer is Randy Anderson Ford, and all you know is your local club, and you just go to the Dairy Queen in the summer and you go to that Ford show, you'll never meet Ford. You don't go to Tulsa. You don't go to Barrett Jackson. Your whole world, 90% of the hobby is guys and gals like that. They just, that's their, so mm -hmm. if you don't go to them, you'll never make a touch. 
So you can't send a rig, $20,000 rig to a little dealer show with 100 cars, but you can send John Clore and his transit for a few hundred bucks, and I'll go and sit up. <laughs> And I'll go a few hundred well, bucks. That's it. It's a few hundred dollars to go to John. A few hundred bucks. How about a six pack and how about a six pack and like a like a large pizza? Well, you know, so loves has Ex those extra large. Extra loves large. has the roller dogs, which are you know they have cocaine. <laughs> the, well, I'm just I, saying, I so we, roller dog. we can go to clubs that would never get touched by Ford. 100, 200 member clubs all across the country in every major city of those clubs you see on that map at clubconnect.com. Mm -hmm. We can visit them and actually connect with them. Show me your car, and guess what? You can't run FordPerformance.com stories from sitting at a desk in Dearborn. Where does this stuff come from? It comes from it, the people in the clubs. They're the characters. They're, it's their cars. It's their driving routes. It's their cool places. It's all the lunatics that built the coolest Fords out there. And how do we find it? We go to them. Don't wait for that. And that's, you know, Henry Ford III, Epsil's boy, was my boss just a few years ago when he bought that transit for me and said, you should just take a few hundred bucks and go out and go to them. And now we're making touches where other car companies don't do that. So you can call it. Oh, and we have an email address, clubhub at Ford.com. Can you get any more plugs in here, John? Come on. Well, can you imagine you can email a car company <laughs> and a real person emails you back? When does no, that happen? You're... You can't do that with Apple. You can't do, you know, it's a real, you know, do that with anybody. So I if think. You're, so if you're a Ford fan, if you're a Ford fan, what's, what's the website they can go to, John? You go to Ford Performance Club Connect.com. Ford Performance Club Connect.com. We'll have and links you, here too. And because if you the Chrissy Smith, uh, cool Mustang Facebook. Oh, page, you did not just call me Chrissy. Yeah. Oh boy. And, and oh, the cool okay, SMN okay. Facebook page for all my clothes. You can. I, I'm, I'm yanking the link. I'm yanking the link out after that. Now I'm just kidding. So you can register <laughs> for free, cost nothing, and then get Ford to promote you. And when we go through your town, you get a phone call. You know, we we're there with you. We will come out. How do we find? How do we know which places to go? When you have an event, and you send it to us, we put it on our events calendar. Now, Chris, if you had 15 members in your club and you were holding a show at Dairy Queen. Do you want Ford to put it out to 350,000 people? Do you want 350,000 people to show up at your Dairy Queen show? No. But you do maybe, want maybe, maybe. <laughs> hey, hey, let's 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 think big here. It's well, not my problem, want, it's Dairy Queen's problem. Well, you do want a quarter of a million people to know about your club. Yeah. And that's the power of using Ford marketing to promote our our enthusiasts. So my program is multifaceted. It, it's outreach on the weekends, the middle of the week it's the website and the e-blast. And it's the rest and, of the time of writing content about you and all you and, people that own Ford. And let me let me attest to this, because um, I, I know this personally. John, you are as hardcore as they get because you travel all over the country. I mean, you are literally at events. It, it seems like it seems like at least once a month you're at an event, if not two or if not two or three times a month. Times a month. And, and then I my know associate, Marcus Cervantes is my associate. He gets the transit on the days I have to cut the grass. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, when I said we're talking with, with Ford Mustang royalty here, I mean, no joke. They're, they're about as hardcore as they come. Um, we, we can't wrap this podcast up just yet though, <laughs> because you know, you know, what's coming. It's impossible to not talk about this. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm pouring oh, out. You're a really shot of, doing this? I, I thought I, it was I'm, a joke. Okay. I'm I'm pouring out a shot of hot sauce while John talks about this here because I know John, you have an aversion to hot sauce. So let's let's I just hate, put a lot of let's just I put a lot spicy of spicy nuggets. I don't like spicy this, anything. This this is an ode to Attack of the Show. We're gonna be red hot pooping here, um, and maybe not just because of the hot sauce because we have to talk about Mustang Mach E. Right. Um, we gotta keep this short. -ish. We, 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 like we got we, we about five keep minutes it, left of the show. We, we gotta so. keep it. We gotta well, keep it shortish. But I told you this wasn't gonna work in an hour. We got, we got, <laughs> we're, we're like an hour and fifteen minute show. So oh, we're, we're, well, no, oh, no, no, we're good. So, so here's the deal. Okay, it's it's a cool looking car. I actually really like it. I've liked it from the get go. Um, I've always had issue with it being called a Mustang because when you look throughout Mustang's entire history. The Mustang has had it, it's not defined by the engine. No, it's not defined by the engine really at all. It's not even necessarily defined by Cooper sedan because I mean, you've, you've got the notch back, right? Which is really a two door sedan. It's defining characteristics have always been 
front engine, rear drive, two doors, kind of that long sloping hood. The pony car. Yeah. It's and and the Maki is none of those. Now there's been a debate. Okay, does the Mustang want to evolve? Maybe this is the direction it has to evolve. Should it be called Mustang at all? I'm I'm I've kind of grown towards the well. You know what? Maybe we can give it a shot. Um, but from the enthusiast perspective, and and I'm involved with some clubs. Um, I haven't really seen much love at all for Mach E and with your ties to enthusiasts, John, I'm, I'm curious and I don't want you to get in trouble at all, but I'm curious to know what you're seeing on your end. And as you said, I mean, Ford listens to enthusiasts. What is Ford going to do here? If they sell a lot of Mach E's and it looks like they might. And then these people try to show up to a Mustang meet in their Mach E. I mean, I mean, what, what's going to happen here? Go ahead while I take this hot sauce shot. So you drink the hot sauce, and I'm going to tell you. You're doing that. From when we first talked to a club member, a club president with the Mach E, he goes, Man, I love the Mach E. I had a Mercury Mach E bro hand. It was a grand Mach E. I'm <laughs> making Mach-y. that again. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 that's what he said. So I said, No, we're talking about the Mach E. And here, here's the story. So, we had an opportunity to come out with a, a groundbreaking EV, mm-hmm. and we're breaking into an area where Tesla has tried to dominate the segment with its breakthrough styling and engineering. All cool stuff. Good, good for them. Problem is they they don't they're really more of a tech company trying to build a car, and we're a car company trying to build something techy. Mm-hmm. So it's a different thing when we build a car. We our welds are a lot different than we see in a Tesla body engineering, all the stuff that we know about, we've been doing for, we've been innovating for 116 years. We did electric cars in Detroit since 1910. Mrs. Ford drove an electric, Detroit electric, 1910. Yeah. So we know about, and the same things that about battery problems that we had in 1910, we, they are issues today. So the question was, do we bring out this car and just call it Ford whatever? The Bolt, the Volt, the, look at GM did. I mean, could have been the lightning. People thought it should have been the Thunderbird since we bastardized that car, made a four door out of it. Both of those are good names, though. Lightning and Thunderbird. I, I, think I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought lightning would have been good. And you know what? Just the Ford Mach E would be good. I, I suggested that to Mr. Farley back when he was just uh, in the Ford division. But the thinking is this Tesla has got such the cool factor that uh, what's the coolest thing we have it for? It's Mustang. It's the coolest thing. Yeah. We actually did research in California where young people were asked about the Mustang, and 80% of them didn't know Mustang was made by Ford. Hmm. Oh, dear. So they said, well, the Mustang brand actually has more cachet than it does than does Ford. In China, when we launched S550, and the Chinese journalist came to the U.S., and I was giving a 50 years of Mustang speech at the Automotive Hall of Fame through an interpreter. I'm thinking, am I losing these people? Are paying attention? Bad interpreter. <laughs> finally, nothing. Oh, I had some good stuff. It was funny. And then all of a sudden, I put a picture, just... <laughs> I put a picture of Steve McQueen up there, and the Chinese jump on to go, bullet, bullet, <laughs> bullet. I'm just imagining so, an interpreter trying to keep up with you. Yeah, well, they could. The interpreter like, I think she had hand surgery. <laughs> but what happened was I realized then Mustang is it means more than just Ford. It, it it personifies in many ways the personality, the wild west go freedom, cool cool factor of Ford. So our management decided let's spend that silver bullet, no pun intended, and put Mustang's name on it. And they thought that if you gave this SUV, this EV, the attributes, handling, looks. Uh, performance, acceleration. Mm. Uh, if you gave it the attributes of a Mustang, if it looks like a Mustang, it talks like a Mustang, and walks like a Mustang, well, then it's a Mustang. And to the enthusiast, Mustang defined a segment, completely defined it. And now that segment defines Mustang. So there is no such thing to our enthusiasts as a non-pony car Mustang. They don't buy it. They don't like it. A lot of them have quit clubs and they're upset about it. Some clubs refuse to let the mach version come into it. Other clubs are going to say... Okay, so Dave Parasak, who did the S550 Chief Engineer, was in the movie A Faster Horse. If you haven't seen that, go look it up. It's you know, I, I, it's a great movie. Uh, it's actually the movie version of my book, the, um, the S550 book. So mm-hmm. he said to me, look, times are changing. If the world goes electric, uh, we have to get so many carbon credits. We're building a 
480 horsepower Coyote. For us to be able to put those in a gasoline-powered car, we need X amount of credits. We have to build, just like we had to sell so many EcoBoosts uh, just to, to make five liters just for the balance of our emission standards, right, but, fuel economy standards. So, but but if, that doesn't explain why it has to be called Mustang. He said if, you, if it's now, if the Mustang brand team has that and it's stable and they make a Mustang pickup truck or a Mustang electric SUV or a Mustang, and all this money goes to Mustang, that gives enough money to for a loss leader to make a small pony car with a gas engine that sells in tiny little numbers that isn't necessarily profitable, but who cares about profit when you have something that is a halo car? It's not about profit. It's about the mystery of the, the magic of the name. So that's their explanation. Enthusiasts don't buy it. Here's the, here's the deal. Ford can make anything they want and call it anything they want. That's fine and good. But guess what? Enthusiasts decide what Mustangs are celebrated. They run the hobby. Ford doesn't have management over the hobby. It's the hobby is the hobby. So if this is their major disconnect and they've spent that bullet like they did with the Cougar, to me, the only cool Cougar was the 68, 69s. And once they became a station wagon with wood grain on the side, dumb. But Thunderbird destroyed that brand. If that's what happened, that's on them. Bottom line is it's on us to celebrate the Mustang we like. And if you like that Mustang and you're going to include it in your club, just like when I first came to my MCA with my Mustang too, they go, oh, you, you can park over by the dumpster. <laughs> park over by the dumpster. You, you know, I mean, that's an interesting point because we started off this conversation with you saying how some club, some Mustang models weren't even allowed in some clubs. You know, it's well, and, and it's all, and it's, when they said, well, Mustang's dying, young people, you know, I don't know how, guess what? SN95 is the entry ticket for young people. You can get these things for a couple is. thousand dollars. My associate's got a hot SN95. That's your, that's your car. So you it buy is them, mine, even, uh, even if they're mine, mine was thirty five hundred dollars when I yeah. got it. And you can, and if the clubs allow you to take it in the show as a project car, and you got a band aid on it that says "ouch" because it's got a dent in it, fine. So get them in the club, and it, it's acceptance of not everybody thinks of the same Mustang as being cool. They hate twos, they hate SN ninety five, they don't like five. Some guys think the only best Mustang we ever built was S one ninety seven. I get it all. I understand all. I, I understand it, but I don't want. 80,000 registries for every color and type of Mustang, we're all in the family. And we should – so if you're if you're a Mustang club that doesn't want a mach -E, that's up to you. You're not going to grow because the young people told us, I would buy a Mustang today if it wasn't a two-seater and, and if it had like a backseat where I can put my dog and I could go grocery shopping. So tell Ford, I would buy it, except now I'm going to buy a Subaru Outback wagon. Careful. So I, so we I, made, I own one of those. Well, good for you. And, uh, <laughs> say hi to your dog for me. Uh, He's right uh, over there. Well, there he is. Yeah. So, that's it. so stereotypes. I'm taking another hot sauce shot. So, so we don't want everybody to buy a Subaru. So if, if that would get you a cool SUV with more room, better acceleration, green, and that's debatable, uh, whatever you want to call it, if that attracts you, and now you can say I'm driving a Mustang, how can that hurt the hobby? How can that hurt? Do so, you, I mean, do you see? Guys, we got. We're already at record length times I, here. Yeah, but, got but I, got, I, I got. I got one more question, Bruce. Oh, okay. We got Go this. We, we got this. Um, do you see the Maki -E bringing new people into the Mustang fold, or do you see Mach E bringing new people just into the Ford fold? Because it seems like from our end, there's a lot of interest in Mach E, but the interest doesn't seem to be coming from traditional Mustang people. It seems to be coming from people who just want that electric green performance. Well, let me just say this in closing. Uh, it's bringing people into the Ford fold more than Mustang fold because Mustang people just so happen to be more traditionalist than ever. Uh, and and they even I know several Mustang people that bought a Mach -E just because they think it's cool and they had a beat up old Eddie Bauer Explorer. Okay, fine. But the bottom line is, it's expanding the Ford brand. We're spending our coolest nameplate on it. We're putting a pony on it. And for a lot of people, that's a complete turnoff. But that doesn't drive them away from the classic Mustang they own. And it doesn't drive them away from the hobby. They're still going to celebrate the cars. And they're going to say, okay, hell with you. If you want to listen to me, that's fine. So right now, the thing to do is let's watch this decision and see if the Mustang hobby goes off on its own and becomes like the Etzel Club and just does what they want. Or if Maki -E truly does bring a whole bunch of new people that wouldn't have considered Ford otherwise and may have thought, you know, that the only cool EV is a Tesla. 
you were going to show people that when the GT comes out in a couple of weeks, uh, we can compete with any electric car company and, and do so pretty well. So that's what the thinking is. It's all up to the enthusiast. God bless them. Agreed. And uh, and I will agree with that. And with that, we'll wrap it up. Um, what? I had so much more to say. <laughs> oh, man, I know. We, Why did you only go five minutes this time? W- will you come back for a future episode? Yeah, yeah I mean, every one of these Every one of these cars could have been a whole show. So, oh, totally. Yeah, these are great cars. It's it's America's great success story. Let's do it again sometime. Great. Absolutely. Well, John, guys, remember with the Mustang, rubber side <laughs> down, shiny side up. Do you have any social uh, uh, outlets that you want to promote? Um, anything Twitter, Facebook? Um, Fordperformance.com is all I'm here to promote. It's not about me. It's about Mustang and Ford. Fordperformance.com, FordPerformanceClubConnect.com. I'll see you online. All right. Well, thank you very much. As we say, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Whenever you're listening to this, we appreciate you. And thanks again to John Clore for being our guest tonight. And as always, thanks, Chris Smith, for being here. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you.